When you think of the word bug, what comes to mind? A crawling beetle? An army of ants? Or that 1998 Pixar film with the weird looking characters? <laughs> For many, the word bug has negative connotations. After all, the term can either signify a harmful, disease-giving microorganism, or a range of land-dwelling invertebrates, which are also generally regarded as slimy, creepy, or just plain gross. But bugs, at least the invertebrate types, are actually pretty cool. The way they sense the world, move, and behave could help us to solve some of our most pressing problems. So let's crawl into the often overlooked miniature world beneath our feet to find out how bugs could help bring us a more solar punk future. My background is in conservation, and I'll be the first to admit that I don't know much about bugs. In fact, this whole video was kind of a big learning journey. My degree mostly skipped over invertebrates. I mean, I remember learning in depth about invertebrate classification, but then once all that was over, we just moved straight on to the cool wildlife of fish, birds, reptiles, and mammals. The invertebrates were just left behind in the dirt. But even those of us who haven't studied nature in any formal sense probably know that beetles exist, and ants live in colonies, and some bees make honey, and butterflies help pollinate. But apart from that, what even are bugs anyway? Well, the term bug is a colloquial term that is actually quite misleading. In general, it is used to refer to terrestrial invertebrates that have six legs or more, such as insects or arachnids. But invertebrates themselves are a massive group of organisms. After all, it's estimated that 97% of all animals on Earth are invertebrates. Insects alone are a class of hexapod invertebrates, and it's estimated there could be between 2 million to 100 million species of them. Recent research has landed on about 5 million species of insect being the most accurate estimate. Yet of those 5 million, only 1 million are actually named and described by science. That means a rough estimate of four-fifths of all the insects on the planet could still be unknown to us. Unfortunately, as with most other life forms on Earth, insects are in a bit of an extinction crisis. In 2019, it was found out that more than 40% of insect species are declining, and a third were endangered, with the total mass of insects falling by 2.5% every year. In 2023, Estimates of the total number of insect species at risk of extinction doubled to 2 million. So yeah, if there really are 5 million species of insects in the world, as scientists estimate, almost half of them would be at risk of extinction right now. That's not good. I mean, insects literally do everything for us. They pollinate plants, which includes our food. They decompose a whole lot of rotting matter. And of course, they act as a major part of the food web for many other species on this earth. Without insects or bugs in general, the entire Earth's ecosystems would collapse and fail. But on a lighter note, whilst the bugs are still with us, I feel like there's a lot we can learn from them to help us pave a way to a more solar punk future. First, let's get inspired by their biology and behaviour. There are one group of insects that I think are particularly suited to learn from when it comes to thinking about a solar punk future. These are eusocial insects, and they encompass species such as ants, termites, and some bees and wasps. Eusociality is usually characterized by two generations of adults of the same species living together, forming a group called a colony. The adults cooperate with each other to the extent that a strong reproductive skew is observed and therefore there is a division of reproduction. In fact, eusocial species tend to share the same four characteristics. One, adults live in groups. Two, there is cooperative care of juveniles, with adults caring for broods that are not their own. Three, there is a reproductive division of labour, meaning that not all individuals get to reproduce. And four, as stated before, there's an overlap of generations. Eusocial colonies are often viewed as superorganisms. These are a group of individuals of the same species that function synergistically as one. Basically, these insects cooperate with each other effectively without a leader. They do so by communicating in lots of cool ways. For example, clonal raiders are a species of ant where every individual is female and reproduces by cloning herself. They are completely blind, but use chemicals to communicate, which they display on their bodies. Other members of their colony will then go over to them and tap them with the tips of their antennae to make sure that they aren't an interloper. In general, ants use pheromones, which are chemical signals, to communicate communicate different messages to each other, such as marking trails towards food or summoning mobs of workers to overwhelm prey. 
Basically, when we look down at a colony of ants scurrying everywhere in orderly or disorderly fashion, we're actually barely scratching the surface of what is going on. Pheromones enable ants to cooperate and communicate on a huge scale, transcending the limits of individuality and therefore allowing them to act as a superorganism. This has allowed for some pretty sick developments for such tiny little creatures, such as leafcutter ants that have developed their own agricultural system by gardening fungi, or wood ants and other ants who have learned to farm and milk aphids for honeydew. This farming is even mutualistic, as in return for their honeydew, the ants protect the aphids from predators. Termites, another eusocial species, build nests with several cells and galleries. Some have crypts and nurseries, and fungus growing termites even have fungal gardens. Workers know when to move between the different regions of the nest to complete their duties. And then there are honeybees, who are well known for their waggle dance, where they accurately signal the location of resources such as food to their nestmates by dancing. Young bees will learn from their elders how to dance well, with different colonies even having different dialects of dance that are shaped by their environments. I feel like there is so much from bug biology and behaviour that we could learn from, and through science uses inspiration to help us solve our own challenges. Like the way ants use chemical signals to work cooperatively without leaders kind of reminds me of how we could use digital signals like social media to help us organise horizontally too. And maybe we should all just start communicating through dance like bees, it would make life a lot more fun. <laughs> no, but more seriously, it's not just you social insects that we could learn from. For example, insects in general are extremely hardy to pain, and we still don't really know how or why. Rather than limping, they'll carry on putting pressure on a crushed limb. Male mantises will keep mating with female mantises whilst they're being eaten alive, and caterpillars will even keep eating leaves whilst parasitic wasp larvae are eating them from the inside out. Then there's flies antennae, which can act as stereothermometers and track gradients of heat. For example, they can tell which one of their antennae is hotter by just 0.1 degrees, and move to more comfortable temperatures accordingly. Meanwhile, tiger wandering spiders can tune the hundreds of thousands of tiny little hairs on their legs to distinguish different air signatures of different insects, noticing when a fly is about 1.5 inches away from them just by how the air moves differently. Lastly, of course, there's spider silk, which can be stronger than steel and acts as a surveillance system, as spiders use slit sensia grouped together in a lyriform organ to detect the vibrations coursing through their webs. The world of bugs is, in my opinion, still a very untapped and overlooked realm, especially in terms of what we could learn from them to build a more sustainable future. Some people, however, are already using what we know about bugs to build new solar punk solutions through biomimicry. Biomimicry is the process of solving design or innovation problems through being inspired by nature or natural processes. Many scientists, researchers, architects, and even astronomers have been inspired by the world of bugs to develop new solutions to some of the more technical challenges we face. For example, termite mounds have been used to inspire energy-efficient buildings such as the Eastgate Centre in Zimbabwe. Termite mounds are complex structures of tunnels, channels, and chambers constructed from soil, water, and the termite's own saliva. Older research suggested that termite mounds maintained stable internal climates by having a physical structure that enabled passive airflow. This inspired the controlled internal climate of the Eastgate Centre, making it more cost-effective and energy-efficient than a usual building due to not having to use air conditioning. However, more recent research suggests that actually termite mounds function more like mammalian lungs. Because of this, changes in internal temperature in the nests are less extreme than changes in the outside temperature during the day but over the course of a year, nest temperatures closely follow the temperatures of the surrounding soil. Still, the original thoughts behind how termite mounds worked did inspire the building of the Eastgate Centre in a way that means it can store and release heat gained from the surrounding environment, facilitated by fans that operate on a cycle, timed to enhance heat storage during the warm daytimes, and release heat during the cooler night times. This particular example of biomimicry is quite a contentious one due to the newer research on termite mounds actually disproving the older research from which the Eastgate Centre's building was based on. But I thought I'd include it anyway because it is one of the more popular examples of biomimicry. Meanwhile, mosquitoes might be the poster child for bringing disease and harm, but it turns out they can actually help our health too. Mosquitoes proboscises are the spear-like parts of their face that they use to feed on nectar, and for female mosquitoes, blood. 
The proboscis acts as a very effective needle-like device that reduces the displacement and deformation of the surrounding soft tissue. Scientists have thus used inspiration from mosquito proboscises to help conduct needle biopsies at cancerous sites without moving the surrounding soft tissue. They took inspiration from the harpoon-shaped notches at the needle tip of the proboscis, as well as the motion of the needle cannula when inserting, allowing much better biopsies to occur. Moving from health onto clothing, spring tails are covered with tiny pillar-like protrusions, as well as a waxy non-polar substance, which helps them to be super waterproof in their environments due to water rolling straight off them. This has actually inspired new, more environmentally friendly waterproof material for coats, using nanotextured filaments to create a non-polar fabric, which is covered by a breathable membrane that is made of the same material as the filaments, meaning the final waterproof clothing is much easier to recycle than its normal counterparts. But we've got a lot more than just health and fast fashion issues to contend with. After all, the changing climate is bringing about increased water scarcity. Luckily for us though, the Namib desert beetle can actually extract water from fog using different patterns of bumps and channels on their shells. The bumps accumulate droplets of water, which then roll into the channels as the beetle leans forwards and straight into the beetle's mouth. This works because the bumps and channels are a mixture of hydrophobic, meaning water repelling, and hydrophilic, meaning water attracting. Researchers have now started developing various structures which emulate the beetle's shells to allow us to collect water from fog too such as using hydrophobic copper mesh bound to hydrophilic cotton, alongside sustainable cellulose films with both hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions. And it's not just climatic problems that bugs could help with, but also human-wildlife conflict. For example, millions of birds are currently killed a year by flying into glass because they can't see it. But one company has actually used spider webs to help prevent this issue. The glass has a patterned ultraviolet reflective coating, which is very visible to birds, but pretty much transparent transparent to us humans, inspired by the ultraviolet reflective silk strands in some spider webs. And lastly, if we want to switch up our attentions to space, it turns out that moth eyes could come in pretty handy. The very fine array of small tapered cylindrical <laughs> A very fine array of small, tapered cylindrical protuberances in moth eyes actually reduce reflection, allowing a lot more light to be absorbed. Well, NASA have used this concept to develop better technology that can allow us to photograph astronomical objects with a much higher sensitivity than we could before. So overall, I think bugs are pretty cool. Despite being surrounded by negative perceptions, overlooked, and at the same time being incredibly at risk from extinction, their behaviour and biology has already inspired many new technologies. And there is still so much we could learn from them. So whilst trying to build a more solar punk future, maybe we should turn more of our attention towards the tiny world beneath our feet. What's your favourite bug? Do you know any other cool examples of bug biomimicry? Let me know in the comments down below. See you in the next one, bye!